What's going on, everybody? Welcome into the Tuesday, April 23rd, 2024 edition of the Daily Energy News Beat Stand Up. Here are today's top headlines. First up, China's state planner warns intensified EV price war on oversupply. Next up, Biden's damaging war against American any production. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Next up, weak diesel prices reflect global economic slowdown, though truckers do uh, say yay. Uh, interesting article here. Next up, Kurdish media allege OPEC request for resumption of oil exports to Turkey. Interesting, interesting. And finally, rooftop solar panels are flooding California's grid. That's a problem. A great opinion piece here um, that ended up actually in the Washington Post. So not often we bring an article in from the Washington Post. So Stu will have a lot of fun with that. He will then toss it over to me. I will quickly cover what's going on in the oil and gas markets today. And then Kimridge decides, or excuse me, Silverbow decides to fight back against Kimridge and launches their own customized website, which always means there's a war going on. So we will describe and cover all that in a bag of chips, guys. As always, I am Michael Tanner, joined by Stuart Turley. Go ahead and kick us off. I'll tell you what, let's start with our buddies over there in China. Uh, state planner warns intensified EV price war on oversupply. I'll tell you what, you can't buy this kind of entertainment, man. Not only do we have plants that they're trying to drop into Mexico so they can flood the U.S., they're lined up and they're going to flood the European market. But let's start in Shanghai. I'm going to get a little tired here. The National Development and Reform Commission, the NDRC, expects more than 110 New energy vehicle models, including a tunnel total of 150 new car launches this year, intensifying. Can, what is going on? Not only are they overpopulating the world and have they figured out what's in the water, now there's they're, they're breeding like rats over there. Yeah, it is a little crazy. You wonder what this means for Tesla as they've continued to take a hit in the overall market with the recalling of the Cybertruck. Um, they're, uh, you know, they were over a trillion dollar market cap. They've now fallen below Exxon. This is going to put a lot of heat on them to continue to kind of, if they're going to compete in this race to the bottom on price, it's going to be very interesting to see what happens. But China, this is, you know, China's going to do what China's going to do. If you didn't expect oh, yeah. them to flood the market with their EVs, what 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 do we think they were going to do? And and the amount of money and what kills me is, and I'm just going to talk about this in the Biden's uh, misnomer of support. They are destroying the U.S. automakers and destroying jobs by subsequently supporting this i don't get it well it, you know um we yeah. could say a lot about it but point is china is going to come in and they're going to continue oh. to put pressure on the u.s car makers and it'll be interesting to see if they take the pivot again not this not an american company but we've always praised toyota for their carving out the hybrid lane you wonder if some of these car makers begin to switch to a little bit of that and boy, there's a lot of uh, rumblings around there about the Hindenburg uh, cars. I mean, the uh, hydrogen cars that are going nuts now. So let's, cars. let's move to the next one. Okay, let's go to our buddy Biden. Biden's damaging war against energy um, uh, American energy production. This one is uh, got a lot in this article, and it comes down to um, a couple points. This is from The Hill. Uh, there is uh, the bottom couple paragraphs here, Michael. This isn't just incompetence, although there's plenty of that. It's an ide ideological effort to smother American energy along with the jobs and income it generates. There is a boom in oil production by waging war against it. President Biden could make it more resilient, uh, more could make us more reliant on OPEC. Venezuela and Russia and the I, uh, years ahead. This is coming up into a lot of different things. The LNG ban that you and I talked about is just absolutely part of this. 
And it is also in the geopolitical things. Think about the economy. If we could help our own environment by getting rid of coal, yay, from a standpoint of going to natural gas. Well, if we make more natural gas, we can export more and it's already dirt cheap and better for the environment. Yeah, no, you're you're absolutely right. Um, again, the 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 devil's advocate here is that everyone's making money right now at eighty dollar oil. We're, right. We, there, there's a lot of activity going on. The, you know, and we're about to cover specifically the diesel prices. Finally, diesel prices have come down to a specific level because I love how the title of the next article implies that low diesel prices are somehow bad because that means growth isn't happening well it also means we can transport things a lot farther and for cheaper and we see lowered inflation so some of this is a little bit of topsy-turvy yes we would all love president trump to get elected well, but he's going to massively lower oil price just by the effect of having his hand on the lever and that's going to you know these these revenue all this revenue that we're making right now may go away so it's weird the war on oil actually makes it more valuable. Oh, uh, yes. Here's the problem uh, with this, though. This is a downstream article. And the next article you bring up is weak diesel prices reflect global economic slowdown. And here's part of this. Uh, Reuters, uh, John Kemp wrote in the recent column that institutional spec uh, speculators are were selling their diesel positions as prices began to decline. That decline for its part is a result of the global trade flow adjustments after the string of ship attacks by the Hooties and the Blowfish over in the Red Sea. Here's part of the problem is the deindustrialization in many parts of the world is attributing for this. In the March reading of the U.S. Purchasing Manager Index, um, now anything over 50 is a sign of growth, but it is, uh, disappointed as it stood at 51.9 while forecasts had been different. In yeah. Europe, you know, I, it is it, totally different. No, it's, it's totally different, but you know, weakness in diesel demand. You know, again, I love Bloomberg is, you know, is a nice little section down here. Bloomberg is also suggested that the weakness in diesel demand and prices may be temporary occurrence, very similar to the tightness in the market last year with prompted analysts to warn about potential shortages, which recently is six months. Luckily, that tightness didn't really happen, which is good news, um, though we did see higher fuel prices get passed on the consumers contributing to inflation, a la the fact that it costs more to transport. So I think you've got there's this weird balance that's going on right now, and I think we're seeing it play out right now you bet uh, you mentioned something michael and i, I just want to say that the biden administration regulatory and energy policies when they go ahead they are going to pull more out of the strategic oil reserves the salt domes and the strategic oil reserve infrastructure is failing because you cannot leave those it's about to happen so anyway, uh, that goes back with that first, that other art article. Let's go yeah. to the Kurdish uh, media uh, alleged, um, alleged, op uh, uh, alleged uh, OPEC request for re uh, resumption uh, of oil exports to Turkey. There is a significant problem, Michael, going on right now around the world. The Iraqi media claims of a request from OPEC have not been in, in, independently confirmed. The new age, uh, news agency, a formal appeal to the Iraqi uh, oil minister, OPEC, has allegedly requested that the Kurdistan uh, Kurds uh, regional government be allowed to export 200,000 barrels of oil per day via the Kurdish export sec, uh, Kayan. Part of this is that the OPEC plus has been over shipping over quota. Saudi uh, Arabia has been really taking it in the teeth uh, because they've been cutting their production Mm -hmm. They need a hundred dollar oil. So the, this is a very great article with second order discussion threads in it uh, because of the Saudis needing higher oil. 
uh, Biden needs lower oil. <laughs> And then they're stopping oil production in the U.S. And so this is just a holy smokes Batman. There are forces at play around the world right now. There are. And it it, it goes to show that geo, a lot of what goes on in geopolitics has to do with oil. And so you always need to be aware of these dynamics. You did a great job of breaking that down. I don't, I mean, I don't really have much to add here. This is, this is your neck of the woods. I mean, where, how do you see this playing out? Maybe is the real question. Well, um, there's about 16 different things on there. And, uh, I see that Saudi Arabia needs it above 90. I'm going to just say, Hey, okay. Saudi Arabia is going to manage their numbers around. Uh, they are cutting back a lot of, uh, kingdom spending, uh, trying to match their budgets in. Europe is is really coming in. Russia, you and I laughed about Russia yesterday. Their uh, growth is more than the U.S., more than all these other countries. So the, uh, old Putin is may not be a nice guy, and I don't agree with everything he does, but he's got Russia first, and he's growing his economy. Um, you know, what's... So... Anyway, let's go to rooftop solar panels that are flooding California's grid, and that's a problem. This one is, holy smokes, Batman, as electricity, the subtitle is, as electricity prices go negative, the Golden State is struggling to offload a glut of solar power. Michael, the old dreaded duck chart is in this article, and if, uh, Miss Producer, we could bring this chart up, in California, ample solar power floods the grid in the middle of the day, and you can see that the yeah. duck is alive and well. Duck's stoop is rolling here. Um, here's the problem. The grid upper, known as Casio, later dubbed the effect as the duck curve, um, and they have had some serious problems. Homeowners are expecting money back. Uh, when it's been sold this way for all of the rooftop solar, the grid yeah. operator now cannot give money back. All the money for these homeowners have a 10 year payback in order to make it uh, available for them. The battery storage is not working. This is an absolute disaster. Here's a quote from Michelle Davis. These are not insurmountable challenges. The head of global solar at the energy research consulting firm, Wood uh, McKenzie, but they are challenges that a lot of grid op operators have never had to deal with, nor do they have a government agency that understand how to fix it. <laughs> Yeah, it's the unintended consequences when your grid cannot handle the supply that it's taking or it's not optimized to take that. I mean, you know, this is a second and third order effect that, you know, on the show we talk about is coming, but I don't think the public or the people who are setting the policies even know. No, uh, absolutely not. And, and you know, Michael, um, I absolutely love solar panels. I love, I'm trying to figure it out. You know that I've got... Uh, dual generators coming online uh, for propane. I got hydro from my local yeah. hydro. Uh, I got solar panels. I love solar panels. I love me building this entire mm -hmm. mini grid in my compound. I'm telling you what, though, it's a nightmare. I, but then again, I'm using this as a learning curve. I do love the sitting there going, I'm, I'm like a little kid looking at that meter going, I get free energy. And I look over at the bill, how much I paid for the solar versus how much my free hydro is. Huh? <laughs> yeah, no, um, very interesting. And of course, this is happening in California. Can't get that's obviously uh, it, it makes us laugh. You got to love our buddies over there in California. Um, yeah. All right. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and pop over to finance before we do that, guys. As always, we'll pay the bills here. Um, check us out, www.energynewsbeat.com. All the news and analysis you just heard is brought to you by that website, the best place for all your energy and oil and gas news. Stu and the team do a tremendous job making sure that website stays up to speed. Everything you need to know to be at the tip of the spear when it comes to the oil and gas and energy 
business. Hit the description below for all the links to the timestamps, links to the articles, um, so you can hop around back and forth. Check us out on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts. You can also check us out, dashboard.energynewsbeat.com. A lot of really cool stuff coming. You know, you know, we're markets actually are 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 are, are positive a little bit today. We see S and P five hundred up about one point eight percentage point. Nasdaq up about one point five percentage points. Uh, thirty year yields uh, down about a quarter of a percentage point. Uh, two year yields down two quarter uh, about quarter of a percentage point. Ten year yields actually up about a tenth of a percentage point. So that uh, unfortunately means we have some some economic so some interesting economic woes coming. Dollar index fairly flat. Um, we did see Bitcoin now up two and a half percentage points sitting somewhere around $66,300. Crude oil, fairly flat, $82 relative to, to where uh, we opened from last night. We have seen a little bit of a rise uh, from the open relative um, to where well, I think I think we opened about 8211. So we're still hovering right around that open for crude oil. Uh, Brent oil, 87 10 natural gas still sitting there about a dollar 78 so that still aren't great you know mainly when you dive into those crude oil numbers um a, a lot of what we're looking at is is that wider geopolitical fear of what's happening in the middle east has continued to to to, to come down you know there is you know it, Ironically, there is some analysts out there that are talking about some of the uh, some of the spare capacity that OPEC is 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 flinging around. Um, you know, though we do, though it does look like as we move into the summer, there will be some strength on the supply side. So I think there's there's a little bit of both. UBS strategist, I love him, Giovanni Stavano. He added that the high spare capacity um, could actually um, not could actually along with the geopolitical risk premiums could drive prices lower depending on how things happen. So it's a very I love the little counterintuitive look. Um, you know. Where Federal Reserve came out, they had a little bit of a speech um, um, earlier today, commenting mainly on what's happening. Some of this um, hotter inflation data. So I, I think things are 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 shaping out. You know, not much happened really on the oil and gas market side. We did see Silverbow, um, who's in the middle of a proxy battle with Kimridge, come out and basically uh, announce their own website, thefutureofsilverbow.com. You absolutely got to see it. Their their main claim as they fight <laughs> as they're fighting um, this proxy season is that Kimridge is is obviously significant overvaluing KTG, which is Laredo Petroleum. Um, they're claiming massive. Um, dilution um, relative to Silverbow shareholders, um, and th again, they're they're very they're convinced that Silverbow, um, or they're convinced that the KGG assets, which again, which is Laredo Petroleum, are much lower quality. And that's what's hilarious. They were told, or they, and they say, if we go to this future of Silverbow site, you can go look at this pretty advanced. Um, um, I wouldn't call it an infographic. I would call it a, a slide deck where they basically say um, they really call out Kimberly. This is absolutely hilarious. They say they've attempted to engage with them multiple times. This was hilarious. Um, they were told by Kimberly not to participate in the, in the Laredo auction, which is interesting because that means, you know, circle in the wagons there. You could go through and read it all. I'm not going to sit up here and, and show for Silverboat because I do think the underlying question going on here is has Silverbow management actually maximized the value there is right. have they actually over the course of the options presented to them absolutely maximize shareholder value and I don't know the answer to that all I know is they hear the noise because they got a whole slide pointed to their quote unquote outperformance of uh, uh other said ec uh keep uh companies within their XOP. Um, if you go take a look on that future for silver bow. Now the real question is, um, you know, this also assumes dividends reinvested when received. You don't know how they break that number down. They claim, you know, since 2011, they're at 500% uh, outperformance, whereas uh, relative the XOP is only 372. So super interesting to see kind of how they break that down again. They, they they don't want any part of this, and they're making very public they'll fight to go back. So 
question how will this end i don't know i do think we need to get a deal spotlight recorded on this so i'm going to be you know if anybody listening to this is is fairly familiar with what's going on with the silver bow um ktg stuff please let's get a deal spotlight recorded because this could be super interesting I want to give you a shout out. I have thoroughly enjoyed the deal spotlights you had with our guests that you've been interviewing. I thoroughly enjoy those, dude. Those you're a rock star with our uh, other guests. We've had some hellacious uh, deals that you've covered. Well done. Yeah, I, I mean, I appreciate it. It's fun. We do, you know, not to promo it too much but we do have a new one coming out on Slumberjay champion x with the wonderful jeff krimmel nice. over there at krimmel strategy group he's a he's an, cool an, in an energy and ofs expert so i it was great to bring him on we'll probably have that out wednesday or thursday um this week to uh to get it so it'll be uh that's a really good one big nuggets we go about 50 55 minutes just pretty much talking oil field service valuations and then diving into the deal specifically um teams working on getting kind of the edits um as always there's edits i'm not 100 percent great so unlike this where we just do it live um well, we gotta, one we of the things that sure. i i do want to give a shout out because emily easily uh she is a pretty cool cat that uh, i'm hoping to uh, get interviewed from oil and gas and solar and wind and regulatory and everything else, our deal evaluations, we've been looking at even wind and solar evaluations as well, too. So here's my evaluation. Don't. Well, <laughs> that's I my valuation I on a solar farm. Don't. But there, there is uh, residuals. There is uh, how do, uh, in fact, uh, I've got a few folks that have been doing royalties don't, don't don't invest your own money in solar. If you want to stand up a solar firm and collect fees, it's a great way to make money. I, absolutely. And, and it's about deal evaluation. So I'm, you don't just I'm, want to I'm wanting to talk to experts. You bet. Um, I'm learning. No, um, we'll, we'll, we're down to collect those fees. I'll tell you that much. But <laughs> All right, guys, we'll let you get out of here. Get back to work. Appreciate you for checking us out here on this gorgeous Tuesday. We'll see you um, around the corner. Till next time. Yep.